Hello and welcome. This is a video built to support students currently enrolled in the AP Research course, part of the AP Capstone program by the College Board. Hello researchers. This lesson has been constructed to help you with citations and avoiding plagiarism in your academic paper. My name is Emily Lott, a teacher from Chesapeake High School in Gainesville, Georgia, and I look forward to helping you with this critical topic. Let's begin with a lesson overview so you know what to expect from this lesson. This lesson will support you as you build citations and work to remove any potential plagiarism from your academic paper. We will focus specifically on LO 1.5D, Employing Ethical Research Practices. So let's get started with a quick reflection and warm up. Where are you in your research process? Feel free to pause and think about this question. Perhaps you're in the planning stages of your research, or maybe you're midway through your drafting process, or you might be totally finished with your academic paper and now you're in the revision process. No matter where you are in this process, citations are critical in protecting and strengthening your credibility as a researcher in your field of study. So let's get started. Here are the key pieces of information you need to know about this topic. First, we must talk about the College Board policy on plagiarism and falsification or fabrication of information specific to our AP Capstone courses. This is the full policy. Read along with me as I read aloud. If you have questions or hesitations regarding this policy, please reach out to your AP research teacher for more information. So the official AP capstone policy on plagiarism and falsification or fabrication of information is as follows. A student who fails to acknowledge the source or author of any and all information or evidence taken from the work of someone else through citation, attribution, or reference in the body of work or through a bibliographic entry will receive a score of zero on that particular component of the AP seminar and or AP research performance task. In AP seminar, a team of students that fails to properly acknowledge sources or authors on the team multimedia presentation will receive a group score of zero for that component of the team project and presentation. A student who incorporates falsified or fabricated information will receive a score of zero on that particular component of the AP seminar and or AP research performance task. In AP seminar, a team of students that incorporates falsified or fabricated information in the team multimedia presentation will receive a group score of zero for that component of the team project and presentation. Let's break down the major terms from this policy so you have more information. First up, plagiarism. Errors happen, and we will get to those in a moment. It's one thing to miss one quotation mark or forget to record a bibliographic entry, even though it's cited as a work in text, but claiming work as your own is a different matter. This connects not only to written work, but to images, figures, graphs, audio, and performance work, as well as full research instruments such as surveys or tests. For example, I did not make this lovely copyright infringement t-shirt design, therefore I am citing where I got the image. Let me be clear, if a significant portion of another's work is used, you may need to gain permission from that researcher to use their work. This means you must plan for the time to ask to use their work in your research process timeline. If you are going to use another's visual or audio or instruments for data collection, these items must be cited and in some cases you must acknowledge that permission was received to even use this work. Please do the work to ensure that you are not violating copyright laws when moving through the research process and document this process in a, an appendix of your academic paper. However, works in the public domain or those that are in Creative Commons are free to use without receiving permission. If in doubt, students should consult the Copyright Act at copyright.gov. 
My suggestion, when in doubt, cite the information. And if you're unsure if you can use something, ask first. The policy of use it, hope that you're not caught, and ask forgiveness later does not apply in this context. In addition to plagiarism, the College Board is very clear as to the ramifications of falsification and fabrication of information. Read along as I review these points with you. Falsification or fabrication is the intentional act of revising pre-existing data or making up data or results and reporting them. Examples of falsification and or fabrication could include a researcher or interviewer completing a questionnaire for a fictitious subject that was never interviewed, falsification of dates and experimental procedures in their study notebook, or as we call the PrEP, the creation of a data set for an experiment that was never actually conducted, misrepresenting the methods of an experiment such as the model used to conduct the experiment, the practice of adding fictitious or theoretical data to a real data set collected during an actual experiment for the purpose of providing additional statistical validity, and finally, fabrication of a note or permission from someone to participate in the study. So how does this affect your score in AP Research? We divide our response to citations at, at the AP reading into two major categories. First, you could just make an error or have an inconsistency in your citation usage. We know that this is sometimes human error, and so this is acknowledged at the reading. Peer review is a fantastic way to check for these items. And I will discuss a tool that is accessible in our digital portfolio in just a minute. Please know these errors will affect your score based on the rubric. So let's review that together. For a score of a one or two, the paper shows multiple errors. For a score of three, the paper shows only a few errors. To arrive at a score of a four or five, you must have few to no errors. Even papers with a beautiful work or a beautiful result or a beautiful conclusion can be damaged by citation errors, which do not consistently follow a specific style guide. But this is where I want to draw a clear distinction, a line with you. Errors and omitting or not including citations are altogether not the same thing. Failing to cite a source in some capacity, either written attribution, in-text citations, or reference section, could be considered plagiarism. Ideally, you would do the following. Provide written attribution that follows your style guide, follow up with that attribution using an in-text citation, and then back both of those in your references section or work cited page. Take care when working on your academic paper and do not attempt to plagiarize by stealing another person's work. Again, if you have questions or concerns about this topic, please speak with your AP research teacher. So let's talk about style guides to help you move forward in doing the right thing and being successful in the attribution of prior researchers' efforts while writing your academic paper. So why do we use style guides? That's a great question. As our academic research community has grown, we have begun to splinter into our different disciplines. This is not a bad thing, but rather quite exciting. This means that more people are adding more knowledge to our collective understanding of our world and beyond, and that bank of knowledge continues to grow. As we splintered further apart into our own discipline communities, writers in these research communities began to realize that the way they were thinking and sharing information was different than the overall research community and certainly different than other research, individual research communities. So to increase clarity for their specific communities of practice, the writers publishing and researching in their fields began to design a more standardized ways of communicating their ideas that fit with the ethics, values, and concepts of that specific field of practice or discipline. 
instead of fighting over which discipline was giving, given the honor of creating the one rule book on style. Each discipline, typically through communities called associations, built their own rule books on academic writing. And now you have witnessed the birth of style guides. These guides cover many concepts, but the three I want to talk about with you are as follows. Written attribution, in-text citations, and references. Just remember, no matter what topic you decide to study, there is a style guide for you. The next slide has a short list of guides to help you make a decision about where to get started. Now that you know why we have style guides, take a look at this list of guides that I found in a quick search online. Your job is to consider which of these style guides connects to your discipline and topic of inquiry and then stick with that guide. Before we move forward, I want to let you in on a little secret. Just between you and me, most teachers, including myself, do not memorize the information in these style guides. Our brains simply can't retain this quantity of information. We, just like you should, use either the most recent hard copy of the publication or we use an online source like Purdue OWL to help us with our citations. Okay, now that that secret is out, let's talk about applying a style guide in your paper. There are three major components of these style guides that you should understand while drafting and revising your writing. Written attribution, in-text citation, and a reference list. So let's walk through these together. Written attribution is the way in which you weave a source of information into your own narrative. So for example, in APA, you would use according to and then add the researcher's name and then provide the quote. You must control the introduction of the quote and do not just throw quotes in your paragraphs at random without written attribution. Not only does this pay respect to the researcher who has found out this information before you, but you also are able to control your voice and increase the engagement of your academic paper for your readership. Also remember, these written attributions are style dependent, so make sure to check your style guide before developing your system for written attributions. Our next concept or component is the in-text citation. And in-text cit citations are specific citations that help relay the location of your sourced information to your audience. And this may typically include an author name, dates, page numbers, source titles, sometimes years. It really just depends. The structure of these in-text citations vary based on the written attribution that you provided and other possible factors. And this could be in the narrative of your writing using parentheses, or it could operate as a footnote or endnote. And you guessed it, this is style dependent. So pay attention to your style guide first to see how you are to build in-text citations. Finally, a reference list, bibliography, works cited. So this is the entire listing of sources cited in the academic paper. And different sources of information have different patterns. So for example, a book is going to have a different pattern of citation in your reference uh, list than a journal or website. Punctuation in these patterns matter. I cannot say it enough. Watch your punctuation and make sure that you proof your work. A period, a comma, a parentheses, a semicolon, all of these things have different values when it comes to your style guide, particularly in your reference list. This reference list could be alphabetically ordered by last name, or it could be in reference, uh, in the order of references in the text. So by that, I mean, you might just have basically what you would think of as a list of last names and then the full reference or it might be the, the type of uh, reference that you use as you move through your paper. So the first reference in the list of your reference list would be the first source that you use in your academic paper. But as I noted for the last two pieces, Richard, written attribution and in-text citations, the reference list is entirely style dependent, including the label. 
Some style guides call it a reference list. Some style guides call it a bibliography. Others call it works cited. And some don't use a label at all. So just keep that in mind as you move forward. So now let's talk about a tool to help you with your citations. The College Board has provided Turnitin inside the digital portfolio. This tool is not a checker for plagiarism. So please stay with me to make sure you understand how to use this tool effectively. You can input your paper through this tool throughout the year for an originality report. A Turnitin originality report simply determines if the writing in your paper matches any other writing found in the Turnitin database. Carefully review the originality report to see if these matches are attributed or cited somewhere in your paper before panicking. If you have cited your sources, no worries. Just know that Turnitin is doing its job in the identification process. However, if Turnitin identifies something that lacks a citation, flag it on your working uh, draft and fix that error before you submit your work. And I wanna take just a moment to clarify. Turnitin typically only works with the written pieces of your text. So if you've borrowed graphs, if you've borrowed visuals, if you've borrowed images from another work, um, Turnitin's not necessarily going to catch those visuals. So just be careful of that as you move forward. Know that this process takes time, but your credibility as an ethical researcher is critical to the overall success of your paper and your reputation. So let's look at an example together. Say you just ran an originality report on your own paper. The originality report from Turnitin flagged this statement in the TAN box as coming from the State of Working America website. You notice that you did not quote this statement, you did not use an in-text citation, and your written attribution, written attribution such as according to the State of Working America, is not present. Furthermore, when you check your references, you did not include this website either. This tells you that you need to flag your working draft so you can add your written attribution in text citation and reference for this source. Again, you should use the Turnitin program as a diagnostic tool throughout the year. You can run originality reports, routinely check your work for an in-text and reference uh, citation, and protect yourself inadvertently against committing plagiarism. Now I'm gonna let you in on one more secret, as long as you promise not to tell. You are going to have to run this report before you submit your paper to the College Board. That should not be the first time you've run this report because you wanna have time to revise and check for plagi accidental pl plagiarism. And um, so if you've not run this yet, maybe take a minute to do it, but definitely don't let submission day be the day that you run your first report. All right, let's move forward. Okay, we've discussed how to read a report. So now I'm gonna help you run one. You first must access your digital portfolio for this practice. Please take a moment to open up the digital portfolio now and identify the location to upload a draft of your work. If you need help with this process, please reach out to your teacher. Pause the video now to complete this task. Next, you will need to run the originality report. Follow along as I read these steps and then pause the video to complete them. First, Upload a PDF version of your paper into the digital portfolio. Be careful, you do not want to submit your final draft to your teacher at this time. Run your originality report through Turnitin. Have patience, it takes a minute or maybe even 10 for Turnitin to compare your work to the works of, in their databases. And then finally, review your results using the next slide. Use the following steps to make changes to your draft. Most importantly, do not panic if your report percentage is high. We can work on this together. First, read all the flags provided by Turnitin, distinguishing which sources have citations and which sources do not have citations in your, in your working draft. 
then you're going to open up your actual working draft, whether this is in um, Microsoft or it could be in Google or whatever word processor you're using. And you want to begin to mark your working draft by adding a comment, highlighting, or writing in all caps. Whatever your form of marking uh, you decide to do, so whatever form of, of identifying where citations are or are not, be consistent to ease your revision process. Personally, I will work in uh, Google Drive quite a bit and use the comment feature. Um, this comment feature makes uh, everything very visible for me in my draft. And the cool part is it also allows me to review all of my resolved comments later if needed. So that's my style. I use it every time I write a paper. So figure out what works for you in terms of your revision process and keep to it. Here is what you need to do for the marking piece. Mark all spots in the paper where sources are missing written attributions. Mark all spots in the paper where sources do not have citations. And mark all missing references from the end of your draft. So just to clarify what I mean here, you're going to have the Turnitin Originality Report visible, and you're going to have your working draft visible if possible. Use the originality report and the highlighting and numbering feature that the originality report provides, like in the example I showed you earlier. Use that type of format to help you see where in your working draft, in your word processor, you need to flag information. Okay. Only after steps two through four should you begin to correct any errors. This is important. If you begin to attempt to correct errors one by one, you may lose your place or grow weary of making corrections. Making a system for marking all errors before starting to correct them will allow you to work diligently and efficiently. Also, once you have marked your paper, if you need to step away and come back, your working draft has all the information you need to keep revising. If you stop marking midway through to begin to correct errors, and then you leave this process upon your return, you may be confused as to where to begin working again. Finally, ask a peer for support in this process. The more help you can get to comb through your paper, through your written attributions, your citations, and your reference pages, the better. Just make sure that this revision and editing help comes from peers and not your teacher or an expert advisor, as this is outside their role as your research facilitator. Finally, press pause now on the video to complete an originality report and the revision process. This could take a while, so don't worry if you need to come back later to the video. Okay, this is important information for your academic paper, so let's review. Let's review the major points from this lesson. First, plagiarism and falsification or fabrication of information can cause you to earn a zero for your academic paper. Errors and inconsistencies aren't ignored at the AP reading, and they can actually affect your score. Style guides are exactly that guides to increase your style in the discipline of your research question or project goal. Use these three components consistently when writing, written attribution, in-text citations, and a reference list. How you cite is specific to your style guide. Use Turnitin regularly as a diagnostic tool for your citations, and create a revision system and stick to it. And finally, don't forget to ask a peer. The more help, the better. We know that not all students have access to the internet or a device. We're working on solutions to help students get what they need to show their best work. If you need mobile tools or connectivity or know someone who does, you can reach us directly to let us know. Thanks for watching researchers. See you again soon.